A Canadian man has been fighting for more than 30 years to come back to this country to serve his prison sentence. Russell Davies was convicted of first-degree murder in 1988 in Florida. W5 has documented his failed attempts to come home to do his time. And now, as Sandy Ronaldo reports, recent developments have breathed new hope into his attempt to come home. Baby, how you doing? This is the one story. Angela Davies talks to her husband, Russ, every day. I mean, if you don't feel that I'm worthy of it, I get it. I still love you. You're my baby. Theirs is a long-distance relationship because Russell Davies is in prison, serving a life sentence for first-degree murder in a Florida state penitentiary. Have a good day, baby. I hope you're good. I love you. Why would you want to get involved with someone that in was prison? in prison? That has to do with the way I feel about him, you know, the way I love him. When we reconnected, it was like, it was left off from that day. Left off decades ago because for more than 30 years, Ross has been behind bars. Angela Davies knows many people won't understand why she would marry a convicted murderer, but they have a history together. He was always in my mind. I've never stopped thinking about him. Ross and Angela Davies were high school sweethearts. They met back in the mid-1980s in a special resource class at their high school north of Toronto, both struggling to fit in. Angela says she was immediately drawn to him. I think it was just I felt safe around him. You know, he was just one of those type of boys that was very protective and, you know, very compassionate. He would always stick up for, you know, the others that were being picked on. But Davy's father, Richard, remembers a very different teenager, a troubled young man. He was having problems in school. He was more rebellious at home. He started to smoke, and I was a strict parent. I wouldn't allow smoking in or around my home. And he was being sent home from school frequently because he backtalked a teacher or was hanging with the wrong crowd. Eventually, he was getting into trouble with the law. Russ was in trouble, but Angela wanted a future with him. You were 16 and I he was, was 17. And he was 17. So it was young love, but you yes. fell in love with him yes, at that young absolutely. age. Absolutely, yes. And you thought he was the one for you, in fact. We were going to run away together and get married. <laughs> so what stopped you from getting married? He did. Angela was devastated when Russ took off without her to Daytona Beach, Florida. <laughs> A destination known for wild parties and fast cars, he hooked up with a bad group of older guys who called themselves The Family. It was 1986, the year of Chernobyl. Challenger, go and throttle up. Challenger, go and throttle up. The Space Challenger disaster. And the year Russ Davies' world came crashing down. And Davies wants to tell his story. So W5 traveled to Carabel in January of 2020, the small Florida town on the Gulf of Mexico, to Franklin Correctional Institution. You dropped out of school. You went to work at Tim Hortons. Yes, ma'am. But then you made a fateful decision. You stole your boss's car, mm -hmm. boss Tim Hortons. You stole your mother's credit card, mm -hmm. and you made your way down to Daytona. Yes, ma'am. What was all that about? You're asking me something that I've asked myself so many times I can't even count. I do not have an answer. No? I wish I did, because I don't have an answer for myself. Everything changed after that. Completely and fast. Yeah. You hooked up with the family? Yes, ma'am. And from the description, I mean, they're a rougher, older group of men, uh, some with criminal records. They would steal alcohol and cigarettes, take street drugs, get drunk, roar around Daytona Beach, had guns. Yes, ma'am. You were in over your head, huh? A little bit. But did you get off on it? This is going to sound crazy. Please don't just, this is just the best explanation I have for myself. 
at that time, I finally felt like I, I, I was part of something. I finally felt like I meant something or I was someone. And I was over my head, but as insane as it may sound, at that time, I was OK with it because I belonged. The 18-year-old was in way over his head. One day, when they were all drunk, the gang decided to get out of town, heading north to Tomoka, this secluded state park off the radar. Every one of us had been drinking all day. Right. So there were guns? I had a gun. I had a gun on me. Why'd you have a gun on you? I don't even, you're, you're asking me questions that I don't like to admit, but I will. It made me feel important. It made me feel like I was a big guy. I didn't feel like I was the kid in the group when I had the gun on me. They were partying, but then a fight broke out in the woods. Don't you take another swig of my friggin' bottle. Davies claims an older member, Jack Cheney, was picking on him. So the teenager pulled out his gun. Um, OK, little bastard. Put that gun down. Put it out. Put that, put that gun down. Go. I got out and I slapped him and hit him in the side of the head with the gun. And the gun went off? Yes, ma'am. And that's when two other family members, Tim Hagen and John Cavallaro, jumped in. And things spun out of control. Tim Hagen pushed me down at that point because he said the gun had just whizzed by his head and I'd almost shot him. But and Jack was still alive at that oh, point. Oh, Jack was, he was on the ground. Tim, he was laid out. Tim actually went over and took his pulse and checked him. He said, you knocked him out cold. But then? John grabbed the gun from where I was in, situated. It looked like he'd kicked him in the chest or in his chin or something and then he put the gun up under his chin and shot him. And? That was it. He was dead? Yes, ma'am. Jack ma Cheney was dead? Yes, ma'am. Did you kill Jack Cheney? Absolutely not. The gang panicked and took off, leaving Jack's body in the woods. Did you think you were going to get caught? Honestly, I didn't, wasn't even thinking about that. At that point in time, my only thought was, oh, no, uh, this is out of control. Why didn't you go to the cops, report what, you, what had just happened? I wish I would have went to the cops and reported what happened. I didn't. These grainy crime scene photos were taken when the skeletal remains of Jack Cheney's abandoned body were discovered a month later. All six members of the family, including Russ Davies, were tracked down, arrested, and charged with first-degree murder. Back in Canada, Russ's dad, Richard, says his family had no idea where their son was from the day he took off for Daytona Beach. They had lost touch with their difficult child after he stole his boss's car. From that point on, Russell was a fugitive. I didn't hear anything more about Russell for almost two years. So no communication with him none. at all for none. two years? None. We prayed for him, but we never dreamt that we would eventually get a phone call saying he was going to be tried for first degree murder. And your reaction when you heard Couldn't this? Couldn't believe it. Despite everything, despite the past, Richard and Carol Davies loved their rebellious third child and went to Florida for his trial. It was held here in 1988 at the Volusia County Courthouse in Daytona Beach. What happened would shock Russ's parents. The five other members of the gang all pleaded guilty to lesser charges and pointed the finger at the Canadian teenager. When we went into trial, I was convinced that the truth would be told. I was convinced naively that it would come out that yeah, I, I, I had done something horrible, but that I wasn't the guy that killed Jack. And I was sure that it was going to come out that the actual bad blood was between John, Tim, and Jack, and that I was just their tool to, to kill Jack. They, they were going to kill Jack and use me to wash their hands of it. So your feeling is you were framed for Jack's Absolutely. murder? Absolutely. Absolutely. Russ's dad, Richard, remembers listening to the evidence. There were two pathologists, uh, one from the prosecution and one from the defense. They were both talking about 
the bullet that actually killed Jack, which was this shot. And I thought, okay, Russell's in the wrong place at the wrong time. He brought the gun to the scene, so he's certainly not innocent, but he's not a murderer in that sense. But Russell was the youngest of the six involved. He was the only foreigner. The rest were all Americans. And I think the rest were offered a plea bargain, and they, the Crown decided, let's go after this guy. Ross Davies says he wanted the jury to hear his side, but his state-appointed lawyer refused to call any witnesses, including the accused. I wanted to testify. That was one of the biggest heated arguments I had with my lawyer. And he didn't want you to testify. He told me that if I testified, he was going to quit. He wasn't going to continue. I'd be on my own. I wanted to tell my story in front of a jury. I wanted to go out there and let them hear raw what would take in place, that they would be able to witness the sincerity without the, the preparation. This still upsets you all these years later. Right? How could it not? Your eyes are glistening. How could it not? Meds did, and I'm responsible for it. I played a role in Jack's death, and, and even though that I can look you and honestly say I didn't kill Jack, you're right, I could have went to the police. You're right, I probably could have said something or done something. I'm not trying to diminish my role at all. Please don't think that. Davies claims the jury never heard the truth. They found him guilty of first-degree murder. His five co-accused all cut plea bargains and were out of jail within a few years. Back in 1988, when he sentenced 19-year-old Russ Davies to life in prison for first-degree murder, the Florida judge admonished him, saying, quote, you are a burden to humankind. The judge then predicted you will live in your own kind of hell on earth. And that's exactly what's happened. In Florida, life is life. Florida's tough on crime policies have kept Davies behind bars for three decades, but he wants to come home and serve his life sentence under Canadian law. And the Canadian government has agreed to take him back. Coming up. It's been 33 and a half years of turmoil. A life sentence behind bars. I can't believe what a broken system the American system is. When W5 continues. Canadian Russ Davies is starting the 34th year of his life sentence at a Florida state prison. He was just 19 when convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life. In Canada, it's likely he'd be paroled by now. Myself, I know for sure that the world I left behind is dead and gone. In Florida, Davies was eligible to apply for parole after 25 years, but the state has a right to change that and did. It increased his parole eligibility to 2046. And for his family and friends, that's unreasonable. He's been in there for a long time, since he was a little boy, you know? Ellen Gardner met Davy's parents some 30 years ago and formed a support group called Friends of Russ. The more we've learned, the more we feel we have to fight. That you can't just sit and accept that it's OK to put an 18-year-old in jail for life. It's just not OK. It's one thing to hear somebody's story. It's another thing to advocate for them for years. And that's what you've done. You've spent years advocating for Russ. Why'd you do that? And why are you still doing it? It's just been too big a struggle to step back from. And I can't believe what a broken system the American system is. Gardner went to Tallahassee, Florida State Capitol, in January of 2020 to make the case for changing Davies' parole eligibility date. She is here along with Angela, Davies' wife, and Florida attorney Reggie Garcia. It's Davies' first parole hearing in five years. The family hired Garcia to represent the Canadian inmate. He was barely 18 years old when this murder occurred in Daytona Beach. He's apologized to the family. He's shown remorse. He's literally done everything humanly possible, certainly the last five and a half years, to be a model inmate. 
I've been advocating for Mr. Davies for about 29 years. The young, immature boy who went into prison at 18 has evolved into a considerate, caring, and very educated man. We do hope you will give him a substantial reduction. Davies' team submitted evidence showing how committed he is to improving himself. He's also become a law clerk, and his wife made a passionate plea for an earlier parole date. I have been blessed with reuniting with my high school sweetheart, and we have recently married. My husband is an amazing, compassionate, intelligent, loving man who spent 33 years in prison as a child. We just want that chance to be a family. In the end, the commissioners agreed to reduce his parole eligibility, but only by five years. He still has to spend another 20 years in a Florida prison. Davies doesn't want to spend two more decades in a Florida prison. He desperately wants to come home to Canada and serve that life sentence closer to family. And that is possible under the International Transfer of Offender Agreement between Canada and the United States. As I understand it, I would go back and be in prison and probably, as I've been informed, probably about six to eight months, I would see the parole board and then they would make a determination whether they'd let me go or not, I don't know for sure. Three times Davies has applied for a transfer and three times Canada has agreed to take him back. Twice the state of Florida has said no. No response on Davies' third request. And now they're trying again. His Florida lawyer, Reggie Garcia, says the U.S. state is acting within the law. It is the exclusive prerogative of the governor. Courts don't get involved. And the international transfer pursuant to a U.S.-Canadian treaty is the governor of Florida's prerogative. That was the first denial. Yes. Davies' family has spent years lobbying Florida officials, and they are frustrated. It's been 33 and a half years of turmoil, frustration. Oh, frustration after frustration. You get your hopes built up because Canada says, yes, we, we will accept Russell's transfer. And then you hit a brick wall, no answers, no explanations. And they're getting help back in Canada. Toronto lawyer Shane Martinez has taken on Davies' case pro bono and will spearhead the new request. He thinks there may be new hope for Davies. Florida's governor has conditionally approved the transfer of another inmate. Despite opposition from Florida's prosecutors, TV producer Enrico Forti, who is serving a life sentence for murder in Florida, may soon return to his native country, Italy. Like Davies, Forty also claims he's innocent. I believe Russ has been denied because in the United States, uh, by and large, there seems to be more of a punishment-oriented view on corrections, whereas here in Canada, we're a bit more focused on rehabilitation and reintegration into society. Is it perhaps because Florida's attitude is you do the crime in Florida, you serve the time in Florida? Essentially, that's it. And the, the system there is also uh, more politicized than it is here. When we sat down with Russ in Carabelle, Florida in January 2020, his most pressing reason for wanting to come home was to see his ailing mother, whose health was declining during her battle with cancer. It's impossible for her to ever travel to the state. She did it for many years, but what difference does it make if I'm in prison here or in prison in Canada? The only difference it would make to anyone would be her coming and her ability to come visit me. We only want our sons close enough to be able to see him, but I don't think they care. We're, Russell's just a prison number. They don't care about us. Sadly, Russell's mom, Carol, passed away three weeks after our interview. He never got to see her again or say goodbye. Russ still wants to be near his aging dad, who's been having a hard time since losing his wife. What do you tell Canadians who are going to say he did the crime in the U.S.? Why should we look after him here? 
And I think that uh, Canadians need to look within themselves and find that compassion and say, you know what, he is Canadian, he ran away at a very young age, he made mistakes, um, but he does deserve to have a second chance. He deserves to be brought back, to be close to his family, to serve his sentence. In February of 2020, W5 requested interviews with the current state attorney and the current governor, Ron DeSantis. They both declined to talk to us. Do you see Canada as Russ's only hope at this point? If he was given this opportunity to be transferred, yes, this ideally would be his only hope. If Russ Davies gets his transfer, it is not a get out of jail free card. But now starting the 34th year of that sentence under Canadian law, he would be eligible to apply for parole. Your fate is in the hands of the governor and state officials in Florida. What would you say to them now to convince them that you deserve the chance to go home and serve your time there? There's nothing I could say to make what happened right, but I would hope that they would show me some mercy and give me an opportunity to show them that their mercy was well-founded. Give me an opportunity and I'll show you that it was well-founded. Along with the momentum from the Italian inmate's successful bid, Davies lawyers are hopeful that issues with COVID-19 and prison overcrowding will help in their case to bring Davies home. <laughs>